Um, welcome uh, to this very first session. Oh, we are early on time, so it, uh, it should be easy to, uh, to keep schedule today. Uh, I'm going to start with a, with a talk uh, about something that has happened uh, last uh, year uh, with uh, a lot of development work going into it, and which uh, is interesting to quite a few people I, I've noticed already. And I guess we will have more than this talk uh, to discuss it. Uh, it's um, claimed to be a keynote, it uh, kind of is, but uh, it's still, on the other hand, uh, some parts are technical, so feel free to ask questions if you feel like it. Uh, you don't have to don't have to make too much keynote. Okay, so um, today's day, of course, and uh, my talk at least, is uh, inspired, overshadowed uh, by two people. <laughs> uh, men of great faith and vision. Uh, I'm happy that uh, actually, I mean, you know, there's uh, uh, competitive events in the city, and uh, I appreciate very much that you pick my talk instead, uh, because I'm going to 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 lean your mostly with with the uh, gentleman on the on your right. Who's the man on the right? Ah, uh, it's Tim Tim Burns, the oh, inventor of the web. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and also the, the visionary and uh, uh, person behind the um, semantic web, which is uh, more of the thing I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so the semantic web has been um, started as a vision, uh, a vision by Tim Berners-Lee mainly, uh, to have a more intelligent web in a sense. And uh, initial articles on that have been very visionary indeed, and uh, some people have taken this a bit too literal, I would say. Some of the vision may be uh, a bit too far-fetched for today's uh, view. On the other hand, many things have come out of it. And uh, I think after 10 years or more of uh, research and development in the field, we can say that the initial vision uh, probably is not quite what happened, but a lot of things have happened, and we are quite close to getting, uh, well, we are close or after already getting uh, much adoption in the, in the practice. Uh, in industry, in research anyway, uh, but in quite another way than Timble uh, originally has imagined this name. Uh, I still think that in a very broad sense one can say the goal of both the original idea of the semantic web and what we currently are doing is to have uh, more intelligent, whatever that means, automated processing of information on the web without direct human intervention. Uh, so that's maybe the most important part. You have a lot of data on the web. It is arguably machine readable, otherwise your browser couldn't display it. But uh, you don't really get to the heart of the information, right? So uh, much of the information on the web is still text-based. You have to read it. Uh, you um, are still the main processing uh, engine for, for evaluating the information in the day. Uh, the idea of the semantic web is to uh, automatize part of the process, in particular automatize the search for answers, the search for data on the web and the aggregation of data. And this is both true for the original vision, I would say, uh, and certainly true for what we are doing today. Um, <coughs> what was the approach taken to, to kind of achieve that, to make more of the web uh, accessible to, to machines and processable in this whatever intelligent means way? Um, well, the first steps maybe taken there was to agree on web-compatible web standard formats for data and also standard protocols for exchanging such data. So uh, much of the semantic web has started at standardization groups at W3C, uh, pushing certain data formats that should be adopted and should enable exchange between different applications so that uh, you don't have proprietary formats mainly. Um, on the other hand, this is all very uh, academic to, unless somebody is actually using it. And so another important part of this whole thing is to develop software uh, and tools for gathering the data, storing it, analyzing it, querying it, which actually work with these formats. And finally, um, the third major column of this or pillar of this, uh, this is work is to establish actual best practices for data publication and, and to get the data published. I think today we are in a space where we already have a lot of data published but still, best practices are often not completely clear. I mean, today when people ask, how do I publish my data? How should I code my data so that it's actually useful to someone? It's often not clear. So there's still, uh, this is still a process we are in. You can't, uh, the semantic web is not something that is developed and then switched on and suddenly everybody has it. But rather, it's a gradual transition to a web which has more and more data in a more and more useful way that is uh, easier and easier to process by, by applications. 
Okay. So what's the status of this uh, as of 2011? Well, we have uh, today what is called the web of data, uh, which is probably and most certainly better name than semantic web, uh, because semantic is already a word that few people can uh, uh, relate to it, and web of data really describes quite accurately what, what we are going towards. So um, today we have uh, a lot of established standards. Uh, there are standards on how to address things with your eyes, your eyes, you are also uh, something new in RDF, uh, uh, which is for data, Sparkle for querying out, for having a model on top of it, and then there are various vocabularies and ontologies in all kinds of fields to actually uh, express data. Uh, we also do have a significant tool infrastructure. There's a lot of data stores and databases uh, available with data, query engines, inference engines, and readiness. We have libraries for almost any programming language you can imagine. And uh, also crawlers uh, and data browsers, which have people have written. And I mean, there's many more to, to make it. So this is something that really has happened in, in recent years more than in the initial uh, phase of the semantic web development, I would say. So uh, for a few years, people have focused on, on, on the formats a lot that had only small prototypes. And then uh, we have seen much more industry adoption with large scale tools which have good support available. Uh, and today we can, can use all this to build applications. What we also have, and that's maybe the most recent uh, development in this whole field, is the large data sources that are actually there. So we really have data on the web, uh, and more and more large organizations in particular are publishing their data uh, in this standard encoding, making it available to the standard tools uh, which uh, support this format. So that all looks very well. And uh, so what we have as of today is, is something that can be visualized like this. Uh, a large graph of uh, many data sets. Each bubble here represents a data set with the size approximately indicating how many, much data is in there to the extent that you can actually measure how much data is in a data set. And these arrows which go underneath each other and underneath the bubbles in part indicate that these things are linked. So that's why it's called linked open data in most cases. It's not just a web where many websites publish some data, but also a web where these websites interlink their data so that uh, connections are established, are explicitly uh, established between these different data sets. And of course, this is not the current status. So this graph will not be updated, right? It's still a year ago. But You're right. This is what we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, that's the new graph published a few days ago. Uh, I'm sure Anya can uh, tell you more about this whole um, thing in her talk tomorrow because that's really the work that uh, the group here in Berlin has been heavily involved in, uh, and uh, which is quite interesting. There's also there are certainly some semantic media wiki data sets in here somewhere, um, but many of these data sets are just coming from very diverse sources. Okay, so the question: What's the role of SMW in all this? Um, in a way. SMW started in a time more than five years ago, uh, almost actually six years ago, I think. Uh, more than six years ago. <laughs> anyway, we're getting old. Um, okay, so more than six years ago, uh, SMW started at a time when <clears throat> much of this wasn't developed quite as, as far as we have it today. So there was much less data on the web. And um, it wasn't so clear how this infrastructure would actually come about to, to exist at some point. And so, uh, one motivation for us to do SMW was to have this wiki as a miniature web, which can be used to uh, demonstrate and exploit all the uh, concepts of the semantic web in a, in a smaller space, which still is diverse, which still is authored by many people, and where you can still exploit all this data in order to aggregate information that otherwise wouldn't be available to you. Um, so that was some idea, but on the other hand, we also from the very start had uh, in mind the data model, which uh, RDF uh, has at its base. I will uh, go into this uh, a bit later. Uh, so we engineered the whole thing in a way that, that is close to the magic web standards and that should be compatible uh, to exchange data. Um, the query model actually is quite similar to our level. I'll also explain this. Um, we have offered early on data feeds, RDF export in the uh, somewhat naive hope that this would uh, make it trigger people to, to build all kinds of fancy applications based on these data feeds, reusing the data in, in new ways which we hadn't envisioned, um, which happened to some extent, but could, could still happen a lot more, I think. 
And, well, there's also some limited mapping and integration features to other data collections, but you see mainly SMW is a world in itself exporting some things and maybe also mapping a bit, but it doesn't really, it doesn't consume a lot and it is, the export to a large extent is, is passive, it just offers the export if somebody uses it, it's nice, but um, if not, it's, it's not going to, to, to map. So, the question really is uh, a big one, if you look at the web of data today, where does SMW really fit into this all? How does it, what's the role, how can SMW really participate in the web of data as it is uh, today? So that's a, a question and uh, somewhat we might want to ask an oracle or, or maybe we need some divine power to, 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 to answer that because it's actually not so easy. Uh, when we started it, we, we thought, well, we, we offer RDF, so it, it can't be too hot. We are, we are part of the semantic web, right? But if you look at the semantic web, web of data graph we have today, you see a few semantic media wikis, but a lot of them, uh, the, the overwhelming majority of all semantic media wiki instances, in spite of exporting large amounts of RDF data, is not on this graph. Simply because it's not, the data isn't really integrated into the linked data cloud and we don't have the mapping. So, so it's not so clear how to, how to actually get it. Okay, so, um, in order to, to give you some background information, let me first uh, say something about the uh, data model of uh, Semantic Media Wiki and RDF. Um, let me first check who of you is actually familiar with RDF. Oh, so many. Thank you. Oh, well, okay. Maybe, uh, uh, yeah, I will still say some words on it, but it's, it's actually good to see that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, familiarity, which uh, and not just having heard the word, is, is, is so widespread. Okay, so this is RDF. <laughs> uh, this is arguably the most ugly way to, to represent RDF, and also it's a way with, in which most people initially view it and say, oh yeah, that's RDF. This strange uh, XML dialect, very fragile, very not very robust, hard to do encoding in, you have to do all kinds of strange encodings. I mean, you know, this escaping strategies we have here, which people sometimes find a bit inappropriate, uh, are needed to get it somehow into, into this encoding. So that's the XML syntax of RDF. But of course, in reality, RDF is a very, very simple data format. It doesn't, I mean, this syntax is just a surface syntax, and you shouldn't expect this to be relevant to you. Even if you're a developer, it's not relevant to you. You will just use a library, and the library will transform the syntax into something which looks more like this. Uh, so RDF is really a graph-based model. Graphs meaning things consisting of nodes and edges and where each of the components are labeled. So we have here an edge which is labeled, well the labels are quite long in RDF it's because they are URIs, um, but uh, we can make something out of it. So we, if this is SMW, so this node represents a uh, semantic media wiki, then there's an edge here saying that this is the home page and then on this side we have uh, see, uh, a, a node representing the home page, which is a normal URL as you know it, but URLs are just representations of, of URIs and IRIs which are used as addresses in, in, in RDF. So what we have is a graph model looking like this, and you can easily imagine this becoming bigger and bigger uh, with many nodes attached, and you can also see how this is similar to what you do in, uh, in a wiki when you uh, have pages and you link them uh, with each other, having one link which is directed from one page to another page and maybe giving it a certain property so that it is uh, annotated in that way. So it already looks a lot like as an um, Now what uh, RDF also has are data types, which I think is a, is a very useful and great feature which many uh, forms <coughs> that you can also use do not really have to the extent uh, that RDF offers. So, um, in this case, the example I have here is uh, providing a release date for Semantic Media Wiki uh, by giving this as a so-called literal, uh, which is uh, usually shown in, uh, when you draw such a graph, you usually use a box in, instead of a, uh, such a, a round block uh, in order to indicate that it's, it's data. And there's a large range of data types available for RDF, which come from XML schema. So for example, if I want to have a date, I can mark it up as being a date, and it's, there's a clear specification how you pass dates, what they mean, uh, and how you process them. Uh, on the other hand, you can also have plain strings, this is called uh, an untyped literal, uh, where you would just say the name of this, the person represented by this bubble here, 
would be uh, this. Okay. So, so this is the other thing in RDF. Now, um, basically that's all. So RDF consists of these graphs, and these graphs consist of very small units, which we call triples. So we have subject, predicate, object, and the object can either be a literal of some data type or just another uh, abstract resource. Uh, and the subject also has always has to, it has to be something abstract. This is mainly for historical reasons. I don't think there's a technical reason why there like, couldn't be literals here. Uh, it's just that it has been done that way. Um, okay, and so this is the basic building block. And if you think RDF, it's really always nothing else but a collection of such edges uh, combined into a large graph. And that's, that's the data you're working on. That's all that is represented. And uh, this is quite simple, I think. So often, uh, semantic web technologies are still preserved, uh, perceived as something complicated, but in fact, it's just a bit of a getting used to face to find out how you can represent arbitrary data in this type of things, which is not too difficult. You can always uh, uh, transform data into a structure which is uh, composed of such a graph-like uh, edges. Um, much work has been done on this. Maybe we also learn about this a bit tomorrow. I don't know. Uh, for example, mapping relational uh, databases into this uh, data model. Okay. So this is all very simple. And uh, knowing RDF, uh, knowing SMW, and uh, most of you also knowing RDF, you will recognize that there are strong similarities between the two things. So on the one hand. Clearly, the triple models, the subject, predicate, object triples, are immediately represented in SMW as page property value triples. So it really looks like this. This is when you enter on a page a certain annotation, you do nothing more but setting a predicate with a certain object and thus uh, entering one triple. So from this perspective, all of you also have a very good feeling why it is difficult to model things only in triples, why it's sometimes not enough. We have spoken about internal objects and records and things like that. So it might be that triples are insufficient actually to capture everything directly, but it's always possible to combine triples in a way, sometimes with auxiliary objects, to capture all the data somehow. And uh, basically you can really say uh, you're working in the RDF data model, just uh, on this level at least, in the triple structure. A difference uh, which SMW has is properties have fixed data types, so RDF is actually even more flexible, even more general. Uh, you can assign some properties, sometimes a date, sometimes another object, sometimes a, a string, and it won't matter, it's still, it's still RDF. So you don't have a fixed type for one property. Uh, in SMW we have that, we have one type per property, simply because it's much easier to, to manage, right? So if a user inputs uh, uh, some information, it's very handy to know whether it's a date or it's a string or it's something else. Uh, if you would have to require the user to specify that every time they put in an annotation, uh, it would just be much more cumbersome to use. So we give up some of the flexibility, not because the data model requires this in a strict sense, but simply because the user interface is getting much simpler if you fix for each property one data type, so users don't have to say it every time. And obviously, you can't guess the data type in a, in a meaningful way. You can't say just because it has only numeral characters, it must be a number. Uh, that would really uh, mix up things quite badly because there might be a reason to have uh, something like a movie title 2001, which shouldn't be stored as a number, but which is a string. Okay, uh, so in a way we can say the structure is more constrained, and also on other levels I would say the structure is a bit more constrained than semantic video wiki because RDF really has hardly any, uh, any constraints on, on any of the uh, language. Uh, features that you can use them. Okay? Um, what we also find is that uh, what is what IRIs and literals in the semantic media wiki are just different types of data items as we call them now in the semantic media wiki. So uh, pages are usually uh, the same as uh, plain IRIs, so identified as objects, uh, generic things in round uh, uh, bubbles in the graph. This is just uh, what, what a wiki page normally represents. And um, then there are many more types of data which all more or less encode RDF literals of a certain data type. Um, on the other hand, it has to be noted that 
the RDF data type sense of the metamedia with data types are quite different. So uh, the typeset of the two is certainly incompatible, uh, incomparable, not incompatible, but, luckily, but quite incomparable because we have uh, in the metamedia wiki, we have data type like uh, time uh, and date, for example, uh, which are used to store a time. But if you, depending on what your enters there, you might get different uh, data types in the RDF. So if you just enter a year number, it will be encoded as a data type which just gives the year for which RDF has a, uh, has a format. So we don't, we don't assume that every year number you enter refers to the 1st of January on this year. We just say it's a year and we export it like this in RDF. But if you enter more of the data, we use another data type so we can actually specify uh, all of the parts. So uh, in this case, we have a situation where one SMW data type maps to many different RDF types depending on what the user really enters. And in other cases, we have the converse situation. We have types text and type string, for example, which basically end up as the same RDF data type, which, which are different in the wiki because of different handling on the user interface level. And in this particular case, the reason is that uh, for our uh, SQL backend, we have to make a distinction between very long strings and, and short strings. So there is a kind of a many-to-many -many relationship and you can't really say it's directly like an RDF entity. But there's a clear mapping at least. Um, I already mentioned that QL there. Are, obviously there are some other data models uh, that one could use and the question is, is RDF really, really the most natural fit here? I mean, what we have been doing and still do in the Magic Media Wiki for a long time is to use SQL. So we have a relational backend. And, um, so in this model, you store all the data in tables. And uh, well, there's a very strong emphasis on the schema normally, uh, which is more a cultural thing, I would say, than uh, something inherent to the data model. So the data model of SQL doesn't necessarily have to be less flexible and more schema focused than RDF. Uh, it's just that the way it's used and the way it's implemented, you usually would specify the exact layout of your tables first, and then you would enter the data which is quite different from what you do in SMW, where you just enter data and the schema somehow falls out of it or is, isn't, isn't too relevant. Um, also, a downside of SQL is it's really hard to do data exchange. If you ever try to uh, migrate data from one database engine to another, you need to know that this can already be a very tough task and it's certainly not meant to be published on the web for others to reuse. Then there's JSON, which is uh, the JavaScript object notation which is uh, an object-based model, which is also quite nice and also quite close to what we are doing in a way. You could say every page is an object and it has properties and values. Um, it's very flexible. Uh, schema does. Unfortunately, there's little data type support, so you don't have, uh, don't have these uh, details, for example, to say that something is a date or refers to a time. So a tool has to kind of you know that when it sees your data that, well, in this property, you always store something which should be interpreted as a date, but you can't tell them that it's a date. Um, it's great as an exchange syntax anyway, especially in lightweight applications based on JavaScript, and we use it in some cases in, in the Mandy Media Wiki. Uh, another downside is a bit that there's no standard for object identifiers. So this whole IRI business where you have unique identifiers, which are, of course, quite long, but uh, are meant to be globally unique and, and, and unambiguous uh, doesn't really exist in JSON. You could, you can also encode it as an RDF JSON mapping at least, maybe there are more, um, but it's not not part of the, the format really. So I would argue that these two are not necessarily so uh, so closely related to semantic media really. But in the end, of course, you can't say we had this discussion yesterday. You can't say that. Uh, one data model is, is, is generally more abstract than the other, or more, more open, or more free, or more, more schema-less, things like that. It is very hard to argue for this on a, on a general level. You can always say, well, I could have stored all of this in JSON, or I could have stored all of this in SQL, or I could have stored all of this, this in a text file. Uh, the question when picking a data model is rather, <coughs> how do you access the data? It's, it's what, what do you want to do with the data? How do you want to evaluate it? Not so much, can I store it? Of course you can store it. You can store it in a JPEG file somehow with some clever encoding, but it will not be nice to do a query over. Um, so this is the main thing we have to look at when we, when we say that RDF is, is a good match for, uh, for semantic media wiki. Uh, how, how close is the data access actually really? Um, now, in, in the semantic media wiki, arguably, <coughs> data access is the most important 
uses. I mean, that's why everybody enters the data in the first place. They want to use ask. And uh, <coughs> the internal language we have for this is ask, uh, which is uh, the thing you enter in the puzzle function. Um, now, for different data models, there would be different such languages to, to, to query the data. One is uh, for the relational model, of course, there's uh, SQL for all the assets. For JSON, there's not really a standard, but there are various uh, NoSQL databases that have some access methods for getting to JSON data. So there are special database architectures for JSON uh, or for object storages in general. And also, they give you some, some access patterns, but it's not, not quite so developed and evolved as in the other two cases. <coughs> Um, okay, so so let us look at, at, at the data and and see how how well uh, we can actually use uh, Spark here to, to get that. So that's what you are familiar with. Um, I guess given that many of you have also seen uh, RDF before, you also have some idea of Spark and uh, probably also of SQL. Um, but how does it all compare to, to Ask? So if you have a query like this. Uh, as I explained yesterday already, there are really three aspects to it. Uh, one is, uh, which pages are the query results? So that's the first line. It tells me I want pages in category city which have a population above 3 million. <coughs> then the second question, what other information should be included? So what else do I want to have in the query result? And this is given by these printout statements here, uh, marked by the question mark saying that I want to have the population and the location of uh, this particular thing. And then the third question is, how should all this be pre presented in the wiki? And there we have format identifiers, we have uh, ways of, well, sorting could be argued to be part of the query, or it's a bit in the middle, maybe. Um, it's not really a, uh, something relating to, to the presentation, maybe it's, it's really something that already happens in the safe one. But you know, of course, that there are many other formatting parameters that you can use to, 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 to decide how this is going to look in the wiki. And now the question is, how, how does it actually relate to the query languages that people have come up with for the other data models? Um, basically, SQL and Spark could just cover one. Um, so that's which pages do we want to have in the query results. Presentation is covered usually by other libraries. Uh, a good example is Spark, which you can also hear about uh, in, uh, on this conference, which is a really uh, very nice um, toolkit to represent data which has been uh, taken from Spark endpoint in this case, and uh, which gives you a lot of parameters to format it and to, to uh, do the layout. And now what is with two with the information in the printout statement that's not actually really directly supported on any level. It's not something that is built into the query language, it's not something that's built into the format, it's something specific to semantic media really. And it wasn't always like that. We had in in very early versions, we had one and two merge, and uh, I will explain what the difference is uh, between these two things. <coughs> Consider this query. Uh, you want cities with population above 3 million, and you are interested to see the population. You want to see its twin cities and what it is the location of. And in the semantic media wiki, this typically would look like this. Uh, and this is, I claim, a three-dimensional table. Uh, which I think is often overlooked by, by, by people. Namely, we have many rows here in the result with, for the different pages. One is Berlin. Um, for each row, we have many cells corresponding to each of the columns here uh, where we see the different information. And for each cell, again, we can have a list of possible values. Uh, this is very different, or this is different at least, from the result models that you have in, in, in Sparkle or in uh, SQL, because there the results are formatted in tables, in two-dimensional tables. Why does it make a difference? Well, you can't have a list in a two-dimensional table, and there's no way to specify that you want to, to, to build a list or a string of, of list things somehow in a two-dimensional table with an SQL query alone. Uh, maybe you could, could combine some functions to do it, but it's not natural. And so what you would get if you do the same query in, in SQL or Sparkle is a two-dimensional projection of this, basically, or, uh, which includes the same information, but in an arguably less uh, uh, suitable way for, for user uh, viewing. So you would have one item per cell, and so you are forced to 
just list all possible answers here. So you have Berlin with the population, Twin City being Paris, location of F and W called. Same with London, same with all the Twin Cities, then again everything with the marathon. So clearly this gives you a lot of roles, and this is how we did it initially. Uh, we, in the very early versions of S and W, we really just used one SQL query. We directly encoded the um, printouts in the query, and what we got was like this. And it's kind of fine as long as something like population only has a single value. Then you would say, okay, Berlin has population with this twin city, and the other twin city has this third twin city. But as soon as you have multiple columns which have more than one value, it, it multiplies. And this is something that you don't want to have on the presentation layer. So that's why we have to be a bit careful and understand what is really the query part when we discuss about query answering on the data level. So this is it. And uh, what is really the presentation of it, uh, or the print out things of it, which we have in SMW, which is kind of a, an intermediate layer. You, could, you can only do that with additional queries that you issue separately. Um, and this is what we do. Okay, now, so what we have to look into um, to understand how this relates to the query languages uh, is only the first phase. How do we select data? And th this will basically determine how natural we find to be one of our data models to be. Uh, again, I use this query here, category city with a population of more than 3 million, and that's how it looks in SQL. So this is really taken from SMW, so it's, uh, that's an automatically generated SQL query for this uh, particular ask input. And if you're familiar with SQL, you can make out some things here. Um, let me point out how to read that well. We select something. All the tables here have names like T5 and T1 and T3. T2 and T4 don't exist. They, are, they haven't been used in this, uh, this query. They, they are part of the, the, the site computation that happened elsewhere. Um, but um, what basically happens here is that we have multiple tables. The ID table, which just stores how it's basically a dictionary approach. So we have uh, internally, we have numbers for everything. We have numbers for pages, and this ID table matches these numbers to the actual page name. Um, we need to put this into the query because we want to have the name in the end, and not just the internal number, because the internal number really doesn't tell us much. And then, to do this type of, uh, of selection, we have to uh, join this with various tables where the information about categories and populations is stored. So we have here a and the inst table, which is for category instances. And we say we want to, uh, to have only those results where the ID of the, of the page is actually the same as the subject uh, entry in this category instance table. And later on, we say that this, the object of this has to be a certain ID 738, which is actually what category city maps to internally. So we, we do this first part with this part of the join. And then we have another table for attributes like population, and we say that we require again that uh, this ID here is the same as the ID in this uh, um, attribute table, and we have an additional restriction saying that the value, the numerical value of this attribute should be greater or equal to 3 million, and the property used in this table should be what is denoted with ID 363, which is population. Um, so this is how it works. It's actually, it's not so unnatural if you look at it. It's, it. it's not so far away. The problem with this is that we have all these ghastly inner joints, which are not a very friendly construct if you do SQL databases. So you have to imagine we have one large table which has all the attribute values. And we take this huge table and, and join it, which is the, at its core, it's a multiplication operation, which means you get a lot more intermediate results. Uh, if you do it in a non-optimized way. And we join this table with the whole of the ID table to and filter out the results where the condition matches. And if we had more such attribute conditions here, we would have to join it again and again for each case. So what this gives you is a, a situation where basically you have one table or a few tables and you join them with themselves all the time. And this is quite bad for, for uh, a database because most of the classical relational databases are not meant to do that. And MySQL in particular does all the optimization in the query by um, judging selectivity of tables. So it says 
should I first look at this table or first at this? Which of those is more likely to be more restricted? And of course, if all the data is in just five tables or so, then often you just have the same table occurring many times. And so SQL judging on, based on table statistics doesn't have any idea what to start with, where to start. So this is not a good strategy to, to source these queries. Okay, and so this is one reason why uh, why SQL sometimes can be surprisingly slow on uh, on simple queries. Usually the situation is you have a query, it works quite fast, you add something, it still works quite fast, you add something, it's still okay, and you add something more, and suddenly uh, it doesn't terminate anymore. Your SQL server is, is dying. I showed you yesterday how you can limit it before this happens to make sure that this doesn't occur, but uh, it's quite frustrating, and we have seen a very nonlinear behavior there. So SQL often just at some point blows up because it's, it has no good optimization for this and then it just guesses and starts to compute millions and billions of, of intermediate results in memory uh, and filtering them uh, until it actually gets down to the one or two results that you wanted to have. So uh, this is why, why SQL is a bit of a problem. Um, now let's look at Sparkle. Um, again, same query. Uh, Thankfully, it's shorter now, a bit less technical too, I think, um, and not, not difficult to understand. I have omitted here some namespace declaration which allowed us to abbreviate the long identifiers you have seen earlier uh, by these uh, writings here. And basically what you have here in the query is just triple patterns. So the triples I have drawn in the graph before, I just write up as three things uh, separated by spaces now. And I say, well, the result I'm looking for has a type category. Now, this is the RDF identifier for category. It's uh, in the wiki namespace, and it has this uh, local name category minus 3a city, whereas this 3a encoding is our special way to say colon. Um, by the way, why is that so? Because this is so because uh, this is, of course, like the HTML encoding, but uh, HTTP encoding, I mean. URLs, but the problem with uh, with URL encoding is that it gives you this percent sign, and if you use a percent sign in the encoding, you are no longer allowed to use it as a page name in a wiki. So you couldn't link to a special page where this is uh, the end part. So uh, in order to have an encoding which works both in media wiki and in RDF, and uh, uh, still faithfully captures all possible names that you can have, we had to go for some something ugly like this. But I mean, if you know that it's a colon, it's quite easy. So we are looking for results that have uh, a type category city, and we want this result to have a property population with some value, value one, and we want to filter out all the rows where uh, the condition is met that this value is greater or equal to three million, which is actually not just a number, but is a something of type double in our case. <coughs> okay, and so I think one can see that this is already a far more natural way of mapping it. But at the, at the core, our hope really, or our, the expectation really, is that any tool which is meant to work on RDF doesn't have, cannot have, uh, table-based uh, selectivity or strategy computation. They have to do something different. They have to be more, uh, more aligned with the data model. And so hopefully, and uh, we've seen that in some cases already, uh, hopefully the strategy for evaluating this query on a typical Sparkle tool is much more suitable than the strategy of evaluating this query on a typical SQL. Um, but actually, and maybe surprisingly, I guess that's what, what few people of you will know, uh, this is still not the thing we had in mind when we engineered ask. So this is quite close to RDF, but it's not, not really uh, so close to, to the ask query language. Uh, rather, what we are doing in ask is, is, is OWL. Um, uh, may I ask, who is familiar with OWL? Still quite a lot. Yeah, not too bad. Um, so, uh, but still quite a lot are oh, not, and I understand because it's not so relevant in the data space, uh, in the web of data uh, application. So, OWL really is a, it's a web ontology language, uh, and it is a language meant to uh, encode high level schema level relationships between uh, different things data. Normally, you you model something in OWL which is more like um, mm. uh, general information about the data as opposed to the concrete data. So you could say something like 
we do in our category hierarchy, for example, when we say every workshop is a type of event, every conference is a type of event. So workshop is a subclass of event. This is a schema level statement that doesn't relate to a concrete workshop or to concrete data, but it rather says something about all the workshops. And that's what OWL is meant for, and for which OWL has a lot of uh, expressive features. Uh, at the core of this in OWL are classes. So in OWL you to describe a class uh, by describing uh, its properties. So you can have class expressions which describe a certain set of objects. And this is exactly what we do in ASK, because in ASK a query always has one result. We select pages. So we describe a set of objects. And this set of objects can be exactly represented in our, uh, in our class expression that looks like this in our syntax. It's a bit longer than the last query, but it's uh, also quite verbose here. It has different constructors in the syntax. And we see here some new things coming in and so, some, of the, some of the things we already know. Other things they they probably thought maybe. It is a functional style syntax, so it means it's like function calls to certain things. In this case, the outermost function is object in the section of, which just means end. So category city and population about three million. So what's this, the intersection of? It's of two things. First of all, the category city, which is just this, a class in all. We don't have to say anything about all you have type here. It's just there. Category city. And the other condition maps to the other thing, which says data some values from. And then there comes a property, and then we describe what the value should be from. So this statement directly translates into this. We could really say population is a property, and being the numbers which are greater or equal to 3 million are just exactly described by this, which is data type restriction on the XSD integer type, which has to be min inclusive uh, 3 million. It's a bit, this is a bit unwieldy, I would say, but uh, it, it captures the thing. And, and it's very hard, every expression in our query language can directly be translated to our in this fashion. And if you are a developer and you ever look into ask queries on the uh, PHP object level, you will see that, in fact, the objects we use to describe a query, to, to model a query, map exactly to these functions here. So we have one description of intersections, we have, which is called conjunction, I think in our case we call this in end. Uh, we have some values type restrictions, and they always have the same, they really use the same data model. So we can really say that this is what we do internally. Um, of course, it's only a tiny part of OWL. OWL, as I said, was made to, to express relationships between such things which we don't really do. Um, but here, yeah, it still has, it shows a close relation. So what we have here as possible query languages is SQL, Sparkle, and OWL. Uh, and I already explained most of uh, the things about them. Um, on a practical level, of course, you have to ask, is that all implemented? And well, for SQL, we know there are a lot of uh, large-scale stable systems uh, around uh, it's very different from ASK, um, but we have implemented the translation, it works fine, fair enough. But the queries we get are usually very unusual and, and don't really uh, run too well uh, in a large scale. Sparkle, not quite as stable, not quite as large scale, but on a very, very good way, I would say, to get to the place where SQL is today. Uh, very similar to ASK, but a bit more complex. Many things you can do in uh, Sparkle you could do in, uh, in ASK. Uh, yet, I think, think many typical queries are fairly typical. And then finally, we have OWL, which has very, very stable, highly optimized implementations. Uh, it's very similar to ASK, also the filter features are a bit difficult to, to map sometimes. But the problem is that the implementations we have are not optimized for big changing data. They are not databases, they are usually reasoners, which do the schema level uh, work. So it's not so, so, so suitable. So, Looking at this, it seems really that Sparkle is, is the best uh, way, to, way to go forward here. And uh, so that's what we did. Uh, look into mapping SQ, uh, ask queries to Sparkle and have this as a native part of uh, SMW. And, uh, well, it's, it's almost perfect. I've listed a few things here which don't work too well. Uh, and we have some some perks. We have some special features in R which we took in because they were easy to do in SQL. They turn out to be not so easy to do in, in Sparkle anymore. 
Uh, and so there are some things which you have to take care of, but in the end, I think it's a fairly good fit. Uh, this is maybe the one case where it's not a good fit. Uh, what's this query about? This query says, I'm looking for everything which has a population above 80 million or is Paris. It's a bit of a strange query, <laughs> luckily, because it's it not supported very well uh, in, in Sparkle. How would you rephrase that in Sparkle? If you know Sparkle well, you, you, can, you can, can think about it for a minute. It's not so easy. You want to select things which have properties, so you have a variable that has a property which has a value above 80 million, that's all fine. Or they should be pairs. But you can't say a variable should be pairs. You have disjunction in Sparkle, you have or, okay, fair enough. But you don't have a condition of being pairs. You can just say it has a property of something. That doesn't really work too well. So uh, this works. Would it, would it be at some class connecting to an old class or something? How? Same as? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could check if it's same as Paris. But unfortunately, the uh, most of the Sparkle implementations don't support same as. So, you, yeah, of course, there is a, and ours has a property called same as, which you could use to check if something is equal to Paris. And that's really what we want to express here. But that doesn't exist in, I mean, it's not plain or yet, right? It, it's not plain or yet, and it's not, not Sparkle either. It's, can only be done on databases that know what our same as means and that implement it properly, which is not necessarily the case, even if they know what it means. Um, so this is what works in Sparkle, but that's that's a hack and that's quite ugly. I, I won't explain it in detail, but it's really <laughs> if you know Sparkle, it's, it, it, it will uh, will not be a nice site for you. Okay, um, I'm not going to go down logic lane here. <laughs> so uh, there could, a lot of things could be said about um, reasoning, about inferencing subclass of relationships, about things you could do with OWL, and which of course are only partly supported in Sparkle and not at all supported in SQL. But um, the new Sparkle standard, Sparkle 1.1, is on a very good way, is, uh, and will support, at least formally, to have logic included in all kinds of ways, and we hope that the tools will follow and, and have more construct support. At the moment, it's still the case that most of the tools support plain Sparkle and plain RDF and don't really do a lot with logical constructs. But things like subclass relationships, subproperty relationships, we already have in semantic media wiki. Same as would also be nice, as I said. Don't send me messages now, Daniel. Actually, sending messages. So, um, there are many things we would like to do with reasoning. Also, when I talk to people here, I often see that people use templates to materialize in the wiki with, in a semi-automated fashion things which could actually be derived if you just were allowed to, to use OWL in a full uh, OWL. So it would be possible in many cases to just model the thing, to say if something is a sub-property of something else in this way and the other thing has a certain value, then this sub-thing should also have this value, something like this. Um, these kind of automatic inferences is, is, is something that I'll could really deliver it. Uh, we're very hope <laughs> that, that people in the future have better support for it so we can add it to, to many people here as well. Okay, now, finally, let me say how, how it works concretely. That's actually quite, quite simple. And since SMW160, we do have support for this. And uh, it's actually rather simple to do, as you will see. Um, you can, as you already saw, RDF and Sparkle are very close to what SMW does, so that's a natural fit. Uh, and it's a good idea to uh, have a database instead of SQL being based on Sparkle. It wasn't so easy to do that before because so far Sparkle had no facility of actually writing data. There was only a facility of querying it, but there was no way to communicate with the database back and in a generic way uh, to, to get the data into it in the first place. Uh, luckily, this, with Sparkle 1.1 one update, we have that. And so we can actually utilize the standard protocol to um, get uh, to, to, to attach any arbitrary conformance store to semantic media wiki without uh, being specific to one implementation. And hopefully, this yields better performance in queries. This also gives you a lot of additional features. Uh, Sparkle endpoints are a highly requested feature uh, that you can get from such a database. And also, hopefully, it helps with integrating uh, other local data sources. Um, if you want to do that, you have a lot of choice. 
there are various advanced platforms to choose from. Uh, I just list some here. Uh, some are free. Some things like Oracle database are, are commercial. Uh, I think for everybody there should be should be something in here. This is more uh, a general sesame, I would say, or more academic. These things are maybe more for the larger scale. Um, but in the end, there are a lot of tools available, also many free tools. Uh, most of the work I've done was based on Forstar because it was free and it worked well for me out of the box. I think Virtuoso is the, the other great free candidate to, to choose from if you want to have open source software. But there are also other uh, options. Feedback is very welcome if you have any experience with this source and we need to adjust something to make them work better. Uh, we're happy to do that. Okay, so how do you install and configure this? Well, it's quite easy. You install the RDF store. That might be not so easy depending on what store it is. Uh, Sometimes you have to compile it, uh, but in most cases it's, it's fairly easy to do it, and support is very good for the things I mentioned here. Uh, you configure the store to run in server mode, normally that's, the, that's what it's, it's supposed to do anyway, so it somehow has to uh, run in the background and offer some service endpoints under some uh, URL or where you can access the endpoint. So usually you use uh, URLs to communicate with such a store. Uh, and then all you have to do is, is to configure SMW to use these services by providing these URLs. So this is what goes into local settings. You say the default store should be the Sparkle store. The Sparkle query endpoint is this URL. Like at port 8080, I have a thing called Sparkle. Depends on your store where this ends up. This is what I got for four store. For four store, we actually have a special setting which exploits some things a bit better in four store that you wouldn't otherwise have. Uh, but otherwise, we just say where it is. Passwords are not really supported, I think. Yeah. So uh, it's there's no no security for, for most things here. It's just just two others. Okay. But on the other hand, it makes it very suitable. So it's it's really not a big deal to set that up. Uh, it's a bit limited at the moment. Uh, Ask is completely supported. So we have all of Ask or almost all of Ask is mapped into Sparkle. And it's executed in Sparkle, the results is fetched, are fetched back and translated back into SMW results, so they look like pages when you view them. But the basic lookups are still done in SQL. So all the data that you have in the printout statements is actually still coming from SQL, and it's still mirrored in SQL. Um, arguably, SQL is actually the better architecture to do such lookups like in the printout statements, because we just fetch things from a table, which is really very, uh, very uh, well optimized in a uh, relational database, but of course one could also think about moving this all to Sparkle and, and have the endpoint as the main thing. Currently the idea is that the configuration allows you to have an endpoint which is on a separate machine maybe, and if it goes down, well the queries won't work anymore, but still the annotation will work because you have all the data locally, you still know the data types of the properties, and the operation of the wiki doesn't depend on it. So it's not only hope that it's faster, but it's also so hope that it's more robust. So even if it crashes, it shouldn't pull down your, your main server, which is not the case for the MySQL backend. If the database goes down wherever it is, the wiki will no longer work, uh, and, and you can't add, even edit. Concepts which I introduced yesterday are not yet supported in the Sparkle store. Let me know if you want that. I, I can, can speed it up uh, if, it's, if it's needed. And uh, there's no emulation for inferencing right now. So Equality works, but subclasses, subproperties are not supported. So hope is really that the Sparkle store is going to support that directly because it is in the specification and we use the right constructs in RDF to, to tell them that this is supposed to happen, but uh, whether or not the store really does that is, is, is not in our control. But I'm not sure if we should simulate it in SMW as we do it for SQL because that's not very efficient anyway. Okay, so let me Conclude, possible futures. Uh, Sparkle in and Sparkle out. Well, many people would like to have SMW offering Sparkle support. It's not so easy to do if you want to do it natively without a Sparkle store because we would have to pass Sparkle and do all the things. Uh, it's quite easy to do if you have, assume that you have an RDF store and you just uh, broker its own service to be available in, uh, in SMW. We could do that and if people are interested, uh, uh, it shouldn't be a big deal to, to do it. Just, uh, just tell us. Um, but currently you already have Sparkle query support directly from the RDF store. So whatever store you run, it will have some endpoints. You can open it to the public or make it available somehow. And then uh, it, 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 it's possible to Sparkle in the wiki. 
On the other hand, the other direction, Sparkle in, is also interesting. You would like to use Sparkle on pages to get data from other sources on the semantic web. Um, this is something we uh, are very close to, to doing. Uh, there are some discussions how, how robust this is, what is, what happens when the web is down, uh, or the other server at least is down, and you have to wait for a very long time until you know. So it's not so clear what this does with page rendering, but in general we think maybe with some asynchronous methods uh, to, to make it a bit less, uh, less tight in, to the performance of the external data source, uh, this could, could work very well and it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be too difficult to get it done in SMW. We already have some extension doing this and of course there's also Spark uh, to do it on, on internal and externally to, uh, to semantic media. Um, Freaky text independent data, we have discussed it a bit. Um, some people say, well, we would like to use uh, semantic media wiki to store uh, data of any kind, not just uh, wiki data, but also have other data, like making uh, SMW a web front and a semantic data store. I'm not, not sure that this is what we really need, but to some extent it could probably be done, and if people are interested, I'm open to project suggestions here. Uh, mapping. Data integration across sources is unsolved everywhere, so I think ideas on this are research topics, you can do a lot on this. Um, currently SMW has some very simple vocabulary import, which does not work with all the app stores. So this is a bit of a limitation too. And we would like to have a much more robust way to map resources, to tell SMW that this URI means this wiki page, and to connect other things to the wiki. Uh, an interesting thing you might want to look at is uh, a prototype project we had, Shortipedia, which also shows that with URIs you can also discover mappings using freely accessible web services and to find new information on the web which you weren't maybe not even aware of uh, and, and to display it inside your wiki. So this is possible and uh, much more could be done to, to explore the space. Um, so overall, um, I think a lot more needs to be done here. I mean, this could even be the current situation. We have some semantic media wikis here, but we would, really would like the semantic media wiki to take part much more in this whole web of data space. Currently, something only gets into here because somebody points it out to Anya, I think, or to, to, to uh, someone. If you add to the datahub.org, it's a candidate. There's a central repository for open data. Yeah. Everything that gets added there and tagged as log, as log, LOD, is a candidate. Okay, yeah, well, maybe we could make it a bit more automated, but it still wouldn't give you the links, because to be in this diagram, it's supposed that you have some connection to some other bubbles in the diagram. And this is basically the mapping task, which is not so solved, and which also isn't the main interest of many wiki users, of course. So many people are quite happy with their wiki being one side, and don't really try to connect it to other sites. So um, we need to show, I think, more of the advantages that you actually have doing this, of the uh, things that you can do which you couldn't do before, like pulling in new data that you didn't have, uh, getting updates from other sites instead of just copying this, this information manually maybe, um, and really exploiting this architecture. I think this is needed to really make people do it, even if we have the technical solution. So uh, many things are here open, and I would say, uh, this was basically my, my talk topic, so why, what, and how of, of connecting it, but I think I should add the who question, uh, because there are certainly more projects here that people can uh, work on, and uh, great ideas, inspiration, and, and visionary uh, uh, programs maybe even, uh, are very welcome, very appreciated in that space. I think there's a lot to do here, and if people feel up to such a task, I would really like to talk and, and get this uh, a bit further forward, because I don't think uh, all of what needs to be done and all of what could be done here uh, can really be done by the current team uh, working in the core of the media. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're
the experience from many people seems like all is very universal or hard to work with. And many people seem to prefer rule languages. Yes. So is this something, what could be a possible way forward for the community in there? Yeah, so maybe to, to repeat the question was, isn't it easier to, to, to use rule languages in some cases instead of using OWL for modeling? Um, I, I would sometimes agree with this, sometimes not. It really depends on your application area, and it also depends on whether you already have data models available that you want to reuse. There are a lot of OWL data models in the uh, life science space, for example, that you might not use. But, my main answer to that would be what we are currently talking about, doing simple inferencing, doing basic things. Uh, subclass is very basic, but you could do a bit more. Uh, this is all possible in OWL as well as in rules. So it's actually, we are still in the intersection of both things. We are not at the place yet where it diversifies, especially if you have a surface syntax. You can make it rule-like if people like it, you can make it OWL-like if people like it, but uh, expressivity-wise, we are still in the, at the very base of all this. I think the decision of what you want to do in the end is, is at a higher level that we don't even have to take it now. Any other questions? No uh, it's just kind of a random technical question. If there's no password uh, protection, how, how, how do you do any handle updates? Uh, how, how does it you know, know which uh, update requests to honor? Well, it just assumes that your local server is uh, accessible or the port where the update service is at is accessible only to people who are allowed to do it. And um, you can basically use any mechanism for port protection that's, uh, to filter out requests. Importantly, the query endpoint and the update endpoint are different. So it's not the case that when you publish your, your query endpoints for other people that they can also write into your database. That's, that's certainly not the case. Also, I think that it's Right, okay, yeah, that's also the thing. It's not, uh, doing it like this is not specific to the Sparkle standard. It's really a, another level to have the security on it. Many other features of the stores are different. Um, luckily, I must say, the stores are still very consistent in the way they support Sparkle in most cases. So, even though the systems are very different, it, it, we can quite well use most of them interchangeably and can we get the same results here. So it's, uh, um, maybe this will change too in the future, but uh, it seems that currently the Sparkle systems still show a more consistent behavior than the SQL system, there, for example. So I think this is a great role. Okay, and with this I would like to pass over to the next speaker, so we'll take a short time. Um, what's your uh, point? Oh yeah, it works. Okay. That's the, uh,